I'd now like to introduce Mary Moriarty, the clinical nurse specialist from St Vincent's Hospital in Dublin. Mary is going to talk to us about coping with fatigue and sleep problems. I think both things all MPM patients have struggled with from time to time. Thank you, Mary, for doing this for us. So hello, um, my name is Mary Moriarty and I am the clinical nurse specialist in the psycho-oncology service in St Vincent's University Hospital in Dublin. I'd like to say thank you to um, MPN Patient Voice for inviting me to come along today and to talk to you about fatigue and sleep challenges. This is a general presentation and, you know, um, I suppose I hope there's something in it for everybody, um, but not everything will be relevant to everybody. But I hope you can get something from it. And it's more or less um, a whistle stop tour, really, of the topics of, of fatigue and, and sleep. And um, there's a lot more information um, in the literature um, than I have time to, to go through today. So thank you and welcome. So even though you're um, part of a group of people who are living with MPN, this is a very individual um, journey or experience. Um, so bear in mind as I'm talking today that, you know, your experience is individual to you, your disease, your treatment, um, your own body and how you respond to treatment. And, and bear that in mind too when maybe you're meeting with other people and um, it's, it's the most natural thing in the world for us all to compare ourselves with others. But sometimes um, it might be helpful to remember that um, what we're experiencing is individual to us. So what is fatigue? Well, we know from the literature and the research that fatigue is one of the most distressing and unpleasant challenges for people with MPNs um, are living with. We know it's the most frequently reported and it's the most severe symptom that people talk about. And when I would meet with people in my work, what they usually tell me is that it feels as if, you know, they're running on an empty tank or, you know, um, their battery feels like it's never really full. And that actually, um, no matter how much sleep you have, you never feel as if you're rested. The other thing about fatigue is, is that it's often isolating. It's difficult to describe um, how you feel to other people. And so sometimes it leads to a sense of isolation. Um, I often hear people telling me that, um, you know, um, people tell me, oh, you look great, but I don't feel great. I feel pretty lousy. And that can be quite frustrating. Um, so, you know, people do don't always look like they're experiencing fatigue and it's not something that, that can be visibly seen to others. What are the effects of fatigue? Well, a lot of the time people don't report um, fatigue to their medical team or their nursing team because people think that it's inevitable and that nothing can be done about it. But fatigue does interfere with your quality of life. It can interfere with relationships. It can interfere with your functioning and your enjoyment of life. And also, you know, with the sense of achievement, because there's often maybe difficulty completing, you know, tasks that in the past you would have completed very quickly and very easily. So, you know, it has an impact on quality of life and your enjoyment. So what are the causes of fatigue? Well, there's multiple causes to fatigue. Usually the illness itself can cause a certain amount of fatigue. And if anemia is present, that will cause fatigue as well. Very often it's the side effects of any treatments or medications that you might be on. Sometimes it's other medical conditions like, you know, if you have some thyroid um, functioning difficulties or chronic kidney disease, um, diabetes mellitus, those things can cause, you know, fatigue as well. Also, the literature would tell us that um, people who are or have um, an elevated BMI um, also struggle with fatigue more so than people who don't have an elevated BMI. Alcohol and tobacco seem to play a role as well. And there's also a connection between low mood depression and fatigue and low mood depression and poor sleep, low mood depression and concentration challenges. Also stressful life events 
And sometimes daytime napping can interfere as well, even though that might feel like the right thing to do. But sometimes having a nap during the day can interfere with your night's sleep and that can interfere with your feeling of fatigue. Normally, um, you know, um, when we, we, we can all experience um, normal tiredness after we've had a particularly busy week or a particularly busy time or a stressful time at work. And usually um, that fatigue is corrected by a period of rest or a holiday or a weekend where we can we have a good night's sleep and we can recharge our batteries. But with fatigue, that doesn't seem to happen. Very often what happens is that people um, who experience fatigue um, tend to maybe save up fatigue or um, store it in, in the money bank. And that's not often um, a helpful way to manage fatigue. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about what we can do um, about fatigue. So I talk about tackling fatigue. So by doing that, we're tackling or managing fatigue. We're going to manage sleep and we're going to talk about support with low mood and anxiety. So what can you do? So um, I suppose in some ways what I want to say at this point is this is a very brief and short presentation on fatigue. And that, you know, um, I, I work with people and, and sometimes I meet them weekly for quite a number of weeks in the hospital to try and help with fatigue management. So this is a very brief and I want to you know, make sure that that's very clear in my presentation that fatigue should really be assessed properly um, by your medical team. And it warrants a much bigger and longer conversation than I'd be having with you today. But there's ways that you can kind of take a management position um, with regard to your fatigue. So the first thing that I would say is I'd always plan my hospital appointment and um, I suggest a lot of the time that people use a notebook and write everything into the notebook. All your questions that you might have for your medical or your nursing team, even if those appointments, as they are at the moment during COVID, virtual appointments, always have your notebook ready so that you can write the answers to what the medical team or the nursing team tell you into your notebook and then you can refer back to them later on but plan out your appointment well in advance you know for weeks in advance of your appointment put into your notebook what comes into your head what questions you have if you're experiencing fatigue write that in and do tell your team about it another way of managing fatigue would be to plan out your day and your week and in another slide i'm going to be talking about planning pacing and prioritizing you know, there might be a role too for having an action plan for the day or the week that's achievable. Very often what happens when people is, are experiencing fatigue is that, you know, we, we decide, OK, on Monday morning, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do this, that and the other. And then you go out and do this, that and the other and you, um, you know, you use up a huge amount of energy and then you're exhausted. And then we get into a vicious cycle of thinking that actually there's nothing can be done about fatigue. It's never going to get better when in actual fact something can be done. So when I talk about pacing and prioritising and planning, I'm talking about planning out your day and planning out your week, prioritising what's the most important things and trying to do the most important things when you have the most energy. Um, and in the Chronic Disease Self-Management Programme or um, the Cancer Thrive and Survive Programme, we often talk with people about asking yourself the following three questions in terms of planning, pacing and prioritising. And the first one is, does it have to be done by me? Does it have to be done today? And is it important? And those three questions can be really helpful to help you prioritise what you should do today or this week or maybe not to. So just maybe even if you want to just um, jot that down in your notebook and, and keep that as a reminder to yourself, you know, when maybe you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed and you're feeling exhausted, um, it might be a good way of you managing yourself and the way you use your energy. So just some coping strategies. 
So I talked about pacing, you know, being careful not to just pick an arbitrary day or date and to start exercising or to start doing things. And um, usually, you know, it's much more helpful if you can take a step ladder approach and, you know, very, very gradually increase maybe your activities. All of this would be in conjunction and with your medical team and, you know, um, chatting with them first before you make any changes to your routine. And I'll talk a little bit later on about communication, but it really can be helpful to communicate both with your medical team, your nursing team, but also with your family and friends, because they can be very supportive in terms of helping you um, to manage your fatigue and manage the energy that you have. And that might be around getting some help with household chores, maybe getting, you know, some help with transport in and out of the hospital or to the supermarket or whatever is, is helpful. Maybe some help with babysitting. But I always say to people, make sure you take a break from fatigue as well. You know, um, distraction and um, not thinking about what's happening in terms of fatigue can be really helpful as well. And also having a look in your community around what resources might be available to you or indeed at the moment having a look online and just to see if there's any more information or educational opportunities that might be available to you around fatigue and coping strategies. When I talk about taking a break from fatigue, you know, fatigue can be, as I said earlier, very isolating and there can be a link between fatigue and low mood or depression. Um, so it's really important that, you know, if we can, we try and, you know, engage in enjoyable activities and fun activities. And we have some fun with whatever we're trying to live with and whatever our limitations are. So what are the enjoyable activities that are available to you right now, even if we are restricted? Link in with friends using Zoom or video or FaceTime, you know, and um, try your best to stay in contact with people. And um, the other thing that might be helpful at the moment is to, you know, engage or, um, you know, get in touch and play card games and um, doing some reading, you know, linking back in, looking at movies that you enjoy um, and, and maybe doing an activity that you've wanted to do for years that maybe you just didn't have time to do. And this might be an opportunity to engage with that. And um, card games can be a really good way um, for people who bri play bridge. There's online bridge now. And that can be helpful because I know a lot of people are missing their bridge and their bridge clubs at the moment. And um, lots of people are missing lots of things. So in a way, what we have to be is try and be creative. And we may not feel like being creative, but sometimes if we can engage in some creative activity that's safe for us to engage in right now, it can be really helpful. I just want to mention for a minute, you know, um, persistent um, cancer related fatigue. So for anybody who is here or listening, um, you know, if you've been through a treatment like chemotherapy or any or cancer treatment um, and you're, um, you're finished your treatment six months or more and you're experiencing persistent fatigue, it's worth having it assessed properly. Um, you know, the research and the literature would tell us that cognitive behavioural therapy can re be really helpful in challenging and managing persistent fatigue that continues for a long time after treatment has finished. And... Um, you know, I would never ignore any new or unexplained symptom or pain. You know, I'd always have that checked. It's really important. So with cognitive behavioural therapy for the persistent cancer related fatigue, it challenges and it looks like it examines and educates us in our thoughts and how our thoughts impact on the choices or the behaviours that we engage in and our emotions and how we feel and also our body sensations and how we might get into sort of negative thinking or um, circular thinking about our fatigue. Um, and that can be really helpful and a really helpful way of, of helping people to manage persistent cancer related fatigue. And that's just a cross-sectional formulation of, of, of how CBT works. But again, this is really brief. That's just, and just a whistle top kind of uh, crash course. <laughs> it, 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 it really, you know, it warrants a much bigger conversation than, can we, than we can have here today. Um, 
I just want to talk more about sleep um, because sleep is something that um, is really important in relation to fatigue. Um, and sleep challenges are something that, you know, a huge amount of our population are experiencing. And it's all often underestimated and underreported. Um, you know, it's, it, the literature would tell us that between 15 and 30 percent of people are experiencing sleep difficulties. And usually more women than men seem to experience sleep difficulties. But, you know, again, it's not a one size fits all. You know, there's individual needs and requirements. Some people need as little as five hours sleep at night time. You know, some people might need nine or 10 hours sleep. But sleep is usually described as something that's restorative and something that's helpful and essential in our lives. It's as, as essential to humans as air water and food. So it's a really important topic for us to discuss in line with fatigue. Um, poor sleep and psychological difficulties often go hand in hand, as do poor sleep and concentration challenges. Um, often if we're experiencing low mood or anxiety, you know, that might be also connected with maybe having trouble or having difficulties sleeping. Sometimes people have experienced difficulties with sleeping for a long, long time. And sometimes that's new when somebody gets a diagnosis of a disease. Um, so it, it's worth having a conversation with, with your GP maybe about or it's worth researching it and looking at it, you know, in a little bit more detail to see if there's something that you can do to help you with that. So again, I'm going to talk a little bit about that today and, and offer some suggestions. But again, um, it warrants a much bigger conversation. Poor sleep is um, often associated with irritability and um, it can be challenging and, um, you know, very difficult to continue to work and, you know, to do a full day's work. And it's, it's, it's difficult and challenging on relationships. It's associated with a reduced quality of life and worry. And then people worry about the poor sleep as well as maybe worry that has been impacting on poor sleep. So sometimes um, medication in the short term can help with poor sleep, but it's not recommended in the longer term. And um, usually there's other, other strategies like sleep hygiene that can be helpful in the longer term. CBTI can be really helpful and um, looking at, um, you know, your 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 sleeping habits or your sleeping issues in, in a more detailed way and trying to challenge your thoughts maybe around sleep. Sometimes we have unrealistic expectations as well, and, and that can be sometimes something that some things that sometimes can get in the way of, um, of poor sleep. You know, so sometimes it's unrealistic for us to expect that, you know, we will sleep all night, every night. Most people wake once or twice during the night, and that's kind of within the normal range. Sometimes psychotherapy can help if we're experiencing poor sleep, because if we're worried um, and worries are interfering with our sleep, having that space or somebody to talk to can be helpful. And complementary therapy, something like gentle massage or aromatherapy can also be helpful. But again, you know, um, make sure that the, the person that you um, that you would attend for complementary therapies are trained appropriately in the complementary therapies that are that are safe for for your disease. And, you know, check it out with your medical nursing team as well. So what helps sleep? Well, when we talk about sleep hygiene. What we really talk about is um, many, many things. Well, the first thing that might be helpful to consider or look at is your environment. So is your environment conducive to sleep? You know, have you got um, a comfortable room, a comfortable bed with comfortable bedclothes? You know, is it is it quiet? If it's not quiet, maybe use some headphones or earplugs to help you. Um, is the temperature of the room um not too hot and not too cold. Um, the research would tell us that if you're too hot, that it's difficult to sleep. The recommendations would be that you try and have a wind down routine in the evening and, and have that every evening. Um, so something like a warm bath, one to two hours before you go to sleep, maybe a snack, but not a heavy meal 
or not a spicy meal late in the evening. And some research would give us an indication that milk can be helpful at night time because there is an ingredient in it which can help sleep. Have a regular sleep wake time. So this is where the napping that I mentioned earlier on in the presentation can interfere interfere with sleep wake time. So go to bed at the same time every night and get up at the same time and keep a daytime routine can be really helpful even at the weekends. Try to go to sleep when you're feeling sleepy as opposed to when you're feeling tired. Because if you're lying in bed trying to go to sleep, that can actually be counterproductive and can interfere with the ability to go to sleep. If we get caught up in a kind of a cycle of worry and worry about our sleep, it can actually get in the way of us going to sleep. So um, again, um, sometimes some distraction techniques can be really helpful and um, distraction techniques like um, counting backwards from three from 300 in threes or thinking all the names of the alphabet starting with the letter A then go to letter B then go to letter C. The reason why we suggest um, distraction techniques is that very often um, if we have difficulty going asleep or if we wake in the middle of the night sometimes our mind is racing with worries and anxieties And if we can actually move away from those worries or anxieties, it can be helpful to get us to fall asleep again. So the distraction techniques are just about um, distracting us from whatever it is that's worrying us. And sometimes if the intention to go to sleep is very strong, that can actually be counterproductive. So very often people lie in bed and and, and the thought might go, if I don't go to sleep, I'm not going to be able to function tomorrow. And so that creates a cycle of more kind of stress or worry. Whereas if you, you know, you probably will be able to function the next day. And if your thought can be, okay, it's okay. I've managed before with little sleep and I'll be able to manage again. And maybe I'll be able to sleep better tomorrow night. Exercise can be helpful um, in improving sleep and um, getting into or getting into the habit of engaging in relaxation techniques in the evening can be very helpful as well. Just a a point around uh, relaxation techniques. you know, sometimes we can try too hard and we can be perfectionistic about that. And so, you know, try to practice relaxation techniques. They may not work in the beginning. And so it's about being patient and kind with yourself and um, give it another go or, or give it a try. Lots of people find meditation helpful in terms of relaxation and um, but not it's it's not a meditation is not meant to help you go to sleep but um, it can be helpful in terms of a routine or a way of, of managing um, day-to-day challenges that are in your life. Strengthening the sleep bed connection is really important. You know, if maybe um, you've spent a period of time where you haven't been well and you spend a lot of time in or on your bed, maybe looking at television, on the phone, paying bills, and, um, you know, uh, maybe working, um, that can actually reduce or weaken the sleep bed connection. So try and keep your bed for sleeping and sex only. Um, try and keep your devices out of the bedroom and um, leave your mobile phone, your laptop and your iPad outside. Um, maintaining a healthy diet having good nutrition can be helpful. And even if you don't sleep well the night before, maintain a daytime routine as long as it's safe and manage worries as best you can. Um, Sometimes um, it can be really helpful in that notebook that you have that I talked about earlier to keep that notebook by your bed. And if you're awake at night time or you're finding it difficult to go to sleep and sometimes, you know, you're worried about forgetting something the next day or worried about making an appointment or worried about collecting something or indeed doing a task, write it in your notebook. So that the next time that it comes into your head, you can say, no, that's in my notebook. I'll check it tomorrow. I won't forget. So I've just mentioned the notebook there and I've mentioned relaxation techniques. It doesn't have to be perfect. And remember that, you know, um, 
to acknowledge a sense of achievement, you know, for anything that you achieve. Sometimes we we forget to um, acknowledge achievements, whether that be that we do something different, that we link in with friends, that we catch and get in touch with somebody that we haven't been in touch with for a long time. Um, it can be really helpful to acknowledge to ourselves a sense of achievement. Sometimes, um, you know, we have an inner voice, maybe that's critical of ourselves. Um, but, you know, um, even attending this webinar or attending this seminar is is an achievement and so to congratulate and acknowledge that for yourself just a point about communication I mentioned earlier maybe asking for some help and so you know sometimes that can be very difficult particularly if you're the sort of person who hasn't asked for help before so sometimes it's a good idea to think about how the other person might feel if you allow them to help you. And so it might be helpful to think, well, my friend is good at cooking, so maybe she could cook something for me. And um, another friend might be good at doing some tasks or, you know, running an errand for you um, or um, organizing something. So it's 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 really good to um, offer that as an opportunity for someone to link in or engage with you. In terms of communicating with your medical team, um, I would always encourage that you write down your questions in advance and, and tell your medical team when you attend for appointments or if the if the appointment is virtual at the beginning of the appointment, make sure and say, I have a couple of questions so that there's a space and time allowed for that in the consultation. Very often people tell me that um, you know, they have something very important that they want to ask, um, but they don't get a chance to do it or they forget when they're um, in the consultation room or they forget when they're on the phone to the doctor, they forget to ask. And that's why the notebook can be really helpful. So just in terms of um, the take home message from today, first things first, just fatigue can be, ta can be tackled and it can be managed. Um, if fatigue is being caused by um, your um, maybe the medication you're on, that's something that the medical team might be able to do something about. If it's caused by pain, maybe something can be done about looking at your pain medication, increasing your pain medication, changing it around. You know, very often people are fatigued because they haven't slept well at night time because of pain. And um, if we can tackle the pain, Maybe it will help with daytime fatigue. Poor sleep can be addressed. There are ways of going about addressing that. Um, at the end of the presentation, I have a number of websites that have very helpful um, tips and ideas around tackling poor sleep and some more information about sleep hygiene. You know, there are... Um, I suppose there are things that interfere with sleep and that would be... Um, Caffeine, so coffee, tea, chocolate, maybe some herbal drinks can interfere with getting to sleep at night time. So it might be worthwhile looking at if, you know, if you're using those substances um, later on in the evening, you know, maybe you can pull them back to before 6 p.m. Alcohol is something that can interfere with sleep as well. Alcohol can, um, we can go to sleep with alcohol, but very often we wake up in the middle of the night because we're dehydrated so you know looking at what might be um, getting in the way of getting us a good night's sleep and addressing that can be really helpful so if you can tap into the websites that I have at the end of the presentation you might get some um, ideas on um, you know maybe behaviours that you can change that might help your sleep um, be patient and kind, you know, with yourself when you're trying to make changes. Um, change is always difficult for all of us. So, you know, go easy on yourself and be kind with yourself. Remember to pa plan and prioritise and pace yourself. Um, because, you know, we don't want to go into that situation where we overdo it and then we feel exhausted and then we start thinking, oh, I, I, I'm always going to experience fatigue. Um, because that can be unhelpful in terms of our thinking. Don't aim for perfection, particularly in relation to the relaxation techniques, if this is something that's new for you. And um, 
quite a few of the hospital websites or the hospital psychology websites have um, tips and um, you know information around relaxation techniques and maybe some guided meditation. So the hospital that you're attending, if you go into the website, um, quite a few of them now have some very helpful information that's online for you to tap into and maybe use at home. And try and have some relaxation time as part of your daily routine. It can be really helpful in terms of managing um, stress and anxiety, but also in terms of um, managing your sleep. If you feel that your mood has been low, um, you know, it might be worth having a conversation with somebody about that. You know, we all experience low mood from time to time, maybe for a day or two. And, and particularly at the moment with the isolation, the restrictions that we're all experiencing, you know, um, if you have suffered from low mood in the past, if it's something that you've experienced, you know, and if you feel that your mood is low at the moment, please talk to somebody about that. Get in touch with your GP um, and get some help with that, because that can also um, be something that can be addressed. And there is a connection between low mood and poor sleep. And these are just some of the websites that um, I might suggest. Um, there's some helpful um, information from the HSC around sleep hygiene. And there's also um, from the NHS, there's some information there um, and there's some video clips. So um, hopefully um, there'll be something there for everyone. And thank you very much for listening and joining with me today. Um, I hope it's been helpful. Um, as I said at the beginning, this is or was a whistle whistle stop tour of fatigue and sleep. There's it's much more, it's much bigger than um, I've had the option to talk about today. So um, you know, please try and get some more information and please do tell your team if you're um experiencing low mood, anxiety, um, fatigue, or poor sleep, because you can get some help with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. I'm sure that your presentation is going to be an enormous help to all those patients who struggle with fatigue and sleep problems. We're really grateful to you for giving your insights and how to cope with this.